Okay, let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me and see my shared screen? Can someone tell me that? Yes. Thank you. Okay. So in today's lecture, I'm going to give you an overview about functions. So you probably learned functions in algebra class. So that's why I say today's lecture is a review and an overview. And hopefully I can reinforce your memory. And in case you missed some things um, in algebra, and hopefully today's lecture will help you pick up those things, okay? So today's lecture corresponds to section 1.2 to 1.5 in the textbook. So homework problems will be assigned from those three sections. Okay, let me start with an analogy. So do you guys like juice? I like juice, okay. So, so to make a juice, we can use a juice machine. So this is my drawing of a juice machine here, okay. So this stuff here is my machine. Looks like an F here, right? Looks like an F. And say I have two bananas, right? Put it together. Looks like a, they look like a, an X, right? And in the basket, right? The basket looks like a parenthesis here, okay? So how this Jewish machine works? <coughs> so you insert bananas, so this X, into the machine, right? So then the machine works, right? We say machine functions, right? Functions, or works to make the juice, okay? So the juice come out from this pipe. So this pipe looks like a what? Like an equal sign, right? And then you get what? You use a cup here. This cup looks like a Y and a collect. And this cup collects the banana juice here. So this is my Jewish machine, okay? And um, so if I use mathematical symbols, so this Jewish machine looks like a Y equals F of X, like this guy here, right? Oh, let me change my cursor here, right? like this guy. So what you can observe from this machine? So what do you see here? So if you put apples as the input, then you can get a apple juice, right? So you see the correspondence between apples and uh, apple juice, okay? Similarly, if you put the bananas, right? You get the banana juice, right? Again, input banana, output banana juice you establish this uh, correspondence here. And if I change my input to grapes, right? Then I get a grape juice, okay? So this juice machine, right? Juice machine, what you can see here is you provide one input, either an apple, either apples, bananas, or grapes, right? Then you can produce one output, right? Either apple juice, banana juice, or grape juice, okay? So this is my juice machine here. And you see this correspondence, and sometimes we say a mapping, right? So you map apple to apple juice, banana to banana juice, and grape to grape juice. Or sometimes we say this is the kind of relation that you can relate 
and apple for apple juice, banana for banana juice, and grape for grape juice. Okay. And this is an analogy to a mathematical function I'm going to introduce. Okay. So before I move on to that, so let me emphasize one thing here, right? So when you supply one input, you can only produce one output. You cannot say, I supply apples to the machine, I will get a apple juice and a grape juice. That cannot happen, okay? So you give me one input, I get a one output. So one output for each input, okay? So this is very similar to a mathematical function, okay? So, what is a mathematical function, okay? So to give you an example, right? In the last homework problem, I ask you to establish a relation between temperature in Fahrenheit and in Celsius, right? Now, so this is a quick review of what we learned in the previous lecture, right? Suppose temperature in Fahrenheit is represented by this symbol or say variable X, okay? And the same temperature, okay, the same temperature can also be represented, uh, can, can also be, uh, be, be, be told in Celsius, right? So then this Y variable is the same temperature in Celsius, okay? And we know that relate, so we know, so 32 Fahrenheit corresponds to zero Celsius, okay? 212 Fahrenheit corresponds to 100 Celsius. Okay, and also we know, so temperature in Celsius changes linearly with the same temperature in Fahrenheit. In another word, Y changes linearly with X. Then I think you can immediately establish the relation between X and Y, right? So, so in this scenario here, so Y depends on X, right? And I tell you Y and X, they are related as a linear equation, as a linear equation, right? Geometrically, in the last class, we learned a linear equation is the line in the Cartesian coordinate system, clear? And now, so how to write down that equation in terms of y and x? So you are given two points on this line, right? So when x equals 32, y is equal to zero. When x is equal to 212, y is equal to 100, right? Then in the last class we learned that we can write down the equation of this line in the form of two-point form, right? Two-point form is easy for this case, right? Because you know two points. So this is the equation here. Y minor, so I choose the first point here, Y minor the Y coordinates of this point equal a slope times X minor the X coordinate of this point here, right? And what's the slope? Okay, remember a slope is what? So when you look at these two points, it's the difference of Y coordinates divided by the difference of the X coordinates, right? So the, 100 minus zero, that's the difference in y coordinates, divided by 212, divided by 32, uh, minus 32, that's uh, the difference in x coordinates, right? So that's the slope. So if you simplify, so you get y equal 5 ninths times x minus 32. So that's the linear relation between a temperature in Celsius and the Fahrenheit, okay? And uh, last time we say this is a linear equation, but now what we can see here is, we can say this is a mathematical function, a mathematical function, okay? So X is the input, so you input a temperature in Celsius, then you evaluate this uh, right-hand side expression, you get the temperature in what? In Fahrenheit, 
So this is called a mathematical function y equal f of x. That f is my machine. Just like that previous case, we have this Jewish machine. So the input are the fruits and the output are juices, right? But here, the input is x and the output is y. And in that machine, right? This is my machine here, right? This f device here, right? And if we say this machine is not working, we say that my, oh, the, my machine is not a functioning, right? So we say functioning. So, so in natural world, we also use a function, right? And uh, so here, of course, the function here is what? So you give me this x and make a number y for you. So how to make that? So this expression here is my function, okay, is my machine. So I'm going to use this x, subtract the two, get the result, then mark a five, grab a nine. That's kind of operation, right? So that, the mechanism in your function, right? And produce this y, this juice. So x is a fruit, y is my juice. So that's a very straightforward way to understand the concept of a mathematical function. So now get to the business, okay? So what's the definition of a function? Now I think it's very easy to understand this description here, right? So a function, I call it F. So this F is like a mechanism, right? A function is like a mechanism or say it's like a machine, okay? So a function or say a relation or mapping or correspondence, right? We have a lot of ways to say things, same thing, okay? So, so of course, in mathematics, we prefer to use the word function. So a function F from a set D to a set E. So what is a set? So now you should consider a set is a collection or say a family, right? Of uh, mathematically speaking, we consider uh, a family of numbers, right? So, and of course, this can be more general. This definition is very general, right? This, maybe this set is a collection of uh, apples, fruits, right? This set here is a collection of, uh, this E set is a collection of, uh, of Jews, so that's also fine, right? So, so a function f from a set of D to a set of E is what? Is a correspondence, right? That assigns to each element x of D, right? So you assign, say, each fruit, right? One element, say one juice, right? So what is called y of E. Is that clear? So that's the definition of a mathematical function. So you can so this is a lot of words, right? And so what you can what you can do here, right? You can use this notations, right? So D is a set, right? You can take an element from this set, then you can map this element to an element in, in this set E, right? From this collection to that collection. And how to do that mapping? So what kind of a mechanism is this F? That's my function here, right? Or another way to say that is F, this mechanism here will assign an element in D, in this set, in this family, in this collection, to a member or element in this set, in this family, right? So D arrow E. That's another way to notate in a, 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 a function. Or use this symbol here, right? So this circle represents the collection of, or I should say the disk. This disk here represents the collection of of input, right? So this red disk here represents the collection of uh, outputs, and maybe some extra stuff, maybe not from the mapping. So, so then the function here, let's put it put F here, right? So the function here would be what? Would it be map an element X from this D to an element Y in this E, right? So mathematically, this is the notation, of course, we see, right? So it's a, y equal f of x. Now you can regard this expression as a, a machine, it's a number machine, right? This is my machine f here, right? It's like a machine here, okay? f is the mechanism of this machine. So the input of this machine is x, right? You give me an x number, x, I will use this x to make a new number, okay? I call it y and the output, right? Input x, Output is y. Y is equal what? Is equal f of x. F x normally so tells you the mechanism here, right? So it's an expression in terms of x. Say x squared, or in the previous case, f x is equal five over nine times x minus thirty two, right? Is that clear? So that's the mechanism. So this f the function tells you how to make y from x. So for example, 
say my fx, okay, so this is how I make my output, right, f, f, f works on x, right, is equal, say, x prime minus x, then the output give me an x, my output will be y equal x prime minus x, say, x equal 1, okay, now I give you 1, so what uh, output you are going to make for me, so y is equal f, okay, f works on 1, right, f of 1, we say, y equal f of 1, which is equal, you plug in 1 into this expression, f1, right? So f1, you replace 1 by x by 1. So 1 square minus 1, you get a 0. Oh, 1 input, 0 is the output. Similarly, if you let x equal 2, then the output will be f over 2, right? Will be 2 square minus 2, and get a 2. So, okay, so input 2, output would be 2. So this is called the evaluating a function, right? Give me a function. Now you can give me some input. I can tell you what's the output, right? That's called evaluating a function. Okay. Any questions so far about the definition of a function? Okay. No questions. So now we know. Okay, a function, right? Is a machine, right? X is the input. Y, let me change my cursor to my little hand here, okay? So X is the input and Y is the output. And we say this X very, so of right now, when you write on a function in this abstract form, right? I don't tell you what's the number, right? What's the number here, what's the number here? It's just use two variables, right? So this X can represent the different numbers, right? And then you get a different uh, numbers as outputs, okay? So just like uh, another machine, like a Jewish machine, where right? you say, okay, Jewish equal F of fruits. Right? So of course, that fruit can be apple, then you get apple juice. Fruit can be banana, then you get a banana juice. Right? So X is a variable here, okay? So it's called an independent variable. Why is it called an independent? Because this guy, right? So it is independent. So I can take the value I can take, right? I can take the X, say, so I can take all the values that I am allowed to take. Okay, so say I can take, so x can take one in this example here. Right, so I can take one. Then after x is equal one, you input it into the machine. So y is not independent at all, right? Y depends on that x, remember? So y, you use this one to make that y. So y depends on x. So that's this y variable. Right, it's called a dependent variable because it depends on what kind of input you give me. So why is it called an independent variable? Why is it called a uh, dependent variable? Okay, I think it's kind of easy to understand that. And then, okay, we remember, right? So this X, independent variable, takes values from a set. That set is called a set D, right? Normally we denote it as D, it means domain. Okay, so this is a new concept. So domain of a function, set D, is a set from which independent variable x takes its value. Okay, so you have just like a, you have a lot of different kind of fruits. That's my domain, right? Okay, so I can take an apple, I can take a banana, I can take a grape. So apple, banana, grape together. That's called a domain of your of your of your of your, of your machine of, of this function here. Okay, so then. So for each input, right, you get an output. Remember, for each input, you can only get one output, right? That's a very important fact, you know, about a function, right? So, so then, of course, so for each input, you get an output, so you can put all this output together, form a family, right? Just like a, you have all these kind of fruits, right? You can use this machine and can, can produce a different kind of uh, juices, right? Put it together, right? This different kind of juices would be it's called a, is a set, is a collection, right? So this set is called the range of the function, okay? So domain of the function and the range of the function. So set normally is divided by R, right? So use the first letter here, right? Domain D, range R, right? So you take that first letter, that's a convenient, okay? Uh, convention, okay? Now, so set R, the range of a function, contains what? Contains all possible values y. Of course, what is letter y? Y is f of x depends on the x, right? For f, for each x in that d, in that domain. And remember, this range, okay, this family is 
contained in that set E. So when we define the function, we say what? We say the function is a mapping, right? Or correspondence from D to E, right? This D is the same D to me. But this E maybe has some elements, right? Maybe you only have three kinds of Jewish, uh, uh, three kinds of uh, three kinds of uh, fruits, right? Let's say apple, banana, and juice. But so this set E, right? So the products here, okay, maybe someone gave you another uh, uh, juice, right? So you have apple juice um, from apple, right? Banana juice from banana, and grape juice from grape. But also you have mango juice, right? Even though mango, you don't have anything in, 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 your, in, your, in, your, in your fruit collection, okay? So this E, okay, set normally can be bigger or equal to that range. So we say the range is contained in E. So this is a notation, mathematical notation. So it tells you the relation between two sets, okay? Between two sets. So R is less than E or equal to E, okay? So that's a comparison of these two sets. Just look some concepts, but I want you to be crystal clear about the concepts because that's very important, okay? So you build your knowledge, right, by understanding the concepts, then you understand the connections between concepts and relations between concepts, right? Or then you can have all these kind of statements, right? Or theorems or formulas, and you understand how they are derived. Then you can apply them to solve problems, to analyze the problems, right? Remember that kind of level of learning, right? Now, any questions so far? So if you, I believe you learned this in algebra already, right? So now you see, so the function, okay, f, right? So takes x from the domain as the input, right? And produce y, which is equal f of x, and that y should be in what? In the range. So x in d is mapped to y in r, right? d and r are two families. So sometimes when you are presented with a function y equal fx, say like this, right? This is a function, so now you see, this is a function f of x, right? How to make x, how to make y, this is the mechanism, right, a formula. But I don't tell you what is the domain or what is the range of this function, right? Of course, based on physics, in this problem here, right, we know that temperature Right, is in Celsius, right? So the temperature in Celsius. Um, so you, you know, you, you have some range for the temperature, right? The temperature cannot be infinitely low, cannot be infinitely high, okay? That's determined by physics, right? So then you, you know the domain of your function, right? So what kind of X, what kind of Celsius I can, I can take, right? And uh, so mathematically speaking, right? When you see an expression, so if D is not specified, right, then you have, it's called an implied D. So you can assume that D, the domain of a function is a set of all possible X values for which FX is defined. When we say FX is defined, which means FX can work, can work, can make sense, right? So it makes sense. Just like you have a Jewish machine, Right, so what's the domain of my Jewish machine? Those kind of fruits. You cannot give me um, a stones right? or give me uh, a hammers or nails, right? Put it into my Jewish machine and to produce juice, right? That's not in the domain. Make sense to you? So you have an implied domain. So for example, so if I give you a function fx is equal one over x, right? That's my mechanism, one over x. I don't tell you the domain, then you say, oh, this function is give me an input x, I'm going to find it is reciprocal, right? So one over x. So of course, we know you cannot divide by zero. That's the only restriction. So the domain is what? x is not equal to zero. Clear? So how to write down a domain? That's metrically, you can write down a domain in this manner. We know domain is a set, right? It's a family, or say it's a collection of numbers, right? Of numbers, of inputs. So d is equal what? Is x. And x, so this under the condition, so this is called under the condition. x 
x is in what? In a set of all real numbers, but x cannot be equal to zero, okay? So I just, I just throw this here. So later on, when you read some other books, so the, you may see this kind of notation. So we use curly brackets to denote a, a set. And the elements of this set is put between the curly, curly, curly uh, brackets, okay? So in this case, the element would be all possible x. And what is that x? x is a real number. So x is in the set of uh, all real numbers, but x is not a zero. So those are the conditions. So x under the condition of this, okay? So that's the way to denote this set. Okay, so that's easy to figure out, right? So now what's the range of this function? So, so you can give me any value of x here as the input except zero. Then of course you can give me an x which is very, 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 very small, right? So one divided by very, very, very small positive number, you'll get a very, very huge number, right? So you can get all these huge numbers. And if you let x equal a huge number, then one over this huge number is getting very, very small, but it cannot be zero, right? One divided by anything cannot be zero, okay? So it turns out you can produce, okay, any kind of numbers except zero. So what's the range of this function? The range of this function is y is not equal to zero. So this is an, here, here I show you another way to, 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 to decide that. So we know y is equal one over x. So I want to see the range for x, for y, right? I know x, right? X can be anything except zero, but what kind of y values I can get? So what I can do here is I, I, can, I can solve x in terms of y. So get x equal one over y, right? So if x, y is the reciprocal of x, of course, x is the re reciprocal of y. Then we know, okay, x, can take any value, remember x can take any value except uh, zero. So that means this y cannot be zero, cannot be zero, right? So, so you see y is non-zero, okay? So the way to say that is range is equal collection of y, y belongs to a set of real numbers, y is not a zero, okay? So, okay. So now you know a function y equal fx. So you have one y value for each x value, right? One y value for each x value. Remember that, okay, remember that. So for example, say y equal x squared, that's a function. Why? Because y is a function of x of x, right? y equal fx. So if you give me x equal one as the input, my y is equal one. You give me x equal negative one, y is also equal one. Negative one squared is also one. That's okay, right? Even though the two outputs are the same, but I, for, as long as you give me one input, I don't produce two outputs, that's fine, okay? This is okay. Now look at this equation here. Suppose I have equation x equal y squared, and x, of course, must be non-negative, right? Because it's square. So then in this case, you cannot regard y as a function of x. You can regard x as a function of y, but you cannot regard y as a function of x. So y is not a function for x. Why? Because you see, if I give you x equal one as the input, so y is equal what? Y can be what? Can be one, because y is one square. Y can also be negative one. Next one square is also one. So using one input, you can produce two outputs. Then we say y cannot be a function of x, okay? This is not okay, okay? You have two outputs for y input. Okay, let me stop here and uh, launch a poll. So I ask you, does the equation absolute value of y equal x define a function y as a function of x? For x? So x input, y is output. So I give you 30 seconds to, to respond to this uh, poll here.
Okay. Of course, you check, right? So give me some x as the input. So let me do some blue color here. Right? Say, let me just test this one. Say x equal one. So that's the input. So what kind of output I can get after this, uh, by, from this equation here? So then I know x value of y should be equal x equal one. But we know then that y can be equal what? Y can be equal positive one or negative one, right? So you have two outputs, right? Outputs. So then by the definition, we know for to be a function, right? One input, you can only generate one output. So this is not a function. So y is not a function of x, okay? This is not okay. Clear? Now, how to evaluate a function? Say I have a function fx, which is equal x value of x minus one. Okay, this is a function because when you look at this expression here, right? When you look at this expression here, I use red color, red color. So give me one x, you subtract that x by one, and you take the x value, how many number you can get? Of course, you can only get one number, right? So it's totally fine, okay? This is different from that one, from this, this is whole problem, because in the pro problem, the x value sign is on y, not on x. So that's the trouble here, okay? So if I want to evaluate, let's say, f2, okay? So give me two as the input, so two minus one is equal one, x value of one is equal one, so f2 is equal one. So you give me negative two, so negative two minus one is negative three x value of negative three is a positive three, right? So that's the way to evaluate a function, right? Very simple. But I want to use this example to demonstrate one thing. And this function f, x actually can be written in this manner. So we have this x value of things, right? So in the last lecture, I reviewed about a number line, I reviewed about a, a x value, right? X value somehow is, can be interpreted as a distance between two numbers, right? So here is the distance between x and y, right? It's always non-negative, okay? So then we know if x minus one, this argument here, x minus one is non-negative, x minus one greater or equal to zero, or say x is greater or equal to one, then x minus one is non-negative, x value with just that non-negative number in the set. So f x equal x minus one, or x greater or equal to one. If x minus y is uh, non-positive, right? So zero or negative, or say x is less or equal to one, then when you take the x value of a non-positive number, the answer should be what? Should be the opposite of this number, right? Say x value of negative three is a positive three. So you need to put a negative in front of x minus one. This x minus one now is non-positive. You get a positive number. So negative, negative, positive, right? So this guy is non-positive, right? Negative, non-positive you get a non-negative, so it's one minus x. So if x is less or equal to one, then fx is equal one minus x. So when you see a function like this, this kind of function is called a piecewise defined function. So you don't, so of course you can, you, 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 for, for x in different, for x, for different value for x, you may use different expressions to evaluate this function, right? You write down your function in this manner, in a piecewise manner, okay? Piece by piece piece by piece, okay? Of course, then if I don't tell you fx is the f of x minus one, I just give you a function like this. So I ask you, what is f2? f2 equal what? So you say, oh, f2, two is greater or equal to one or less or equal to one. Of course, two is greater or equal to one. Then I should use this formula to compute, right? So two greater or equal to one, so f2 would be two minus one, which is equal to one. So if I give you a negative two, Oh, next two is less or equal to one. Of course, I need to use this one minus x as the formula to compute fx, right? So it's f next two is one minus next two is equal to three. Of course, consistent with here, with, with the previous result. Now, so this fx, this machine, right, is, is a, a machine on x, right? So f of x, right, is an expression of x, right, involving x. So for example, fx equal one over one over one x minus one. And you should remember this x here is just a symbol, right? It's a symbol. It's just a symbol to denote the, the input, right? So this x can take a 
one, can take a two, can take three, can take a, this is values from the domain, right? So this, you should consider this X as a what? As a placeholder. What does that mean? So, so you, if you give me an X, what's the output? So you subcapital X by one, then you do the reciprocal. So if I change this, so this X is just a hold a place in this expression here. So if I, so if this guy you give me whatever input here, so what's the output? So for this input here, I use now I use a box here, right? So you can fill whatever you, in this box. Then the output would be what? Would it be you replace this X by the X is a placeholder, right? So this guy now is my box here, right? So it's a, whatever you give me, right? That box subtract one, that is the reciprocal, right? One over that box minus one. So that's called a placeholder. Placeholder. So of course. So when we're evaluating a function, right, you can replace x by a number, right? So f2 would be equal 1 over 2 minus 1, right? So you substitute x by 2. That's easy. But if I tell you what is f2 plus 1, I don't ask you to compute 2 plus 1 as a 3. I just say 2 plus 1 as a whole, right? So how to evaluate this guy? So remember, so, so now x is replaced by what? The placeholder here. Now this box here will be 2 plus 1 now. So you just substitute this two plus one to this placeholder here, right? So you replace this host by two plus one. Now, of course, you get one over two, which is one over three minus one. Same thing, right? Oh, you say, oh, this is so easy, right? I, I, of course, I know that, right? But sometimes this is very important, actually. So for example, now I can make things a little bit interesting. Say, I ask you to evaluate the f of a square minus a plus one. Now, I don't give you a specific number, right? I just say it's a square minus a plus one. So what are you going to do? So at the end of the day, a square minus a plus one for whatever a, that gives you just a number, right? It just regard this whole thing, even though it looks a, a little bit long, right? This kind of a messy stuff. But at the end of the day, it's just a number, whatever number it is, right? Then if I want to make an output from that number, it's just a, Put that number into the place right, for x, right? So that's my place for x, right? So you just substitute this a square minus a plus one there, right? Then you subtract one, then to the reciprocal, right? So it's one over, then of course the algebra, one, one cancel this, one over a square minus a. Is that clear? So this is very important, okay, to know that, right? So this x is a placeholder. You can replace x by 2x. You can replace x by y, uh, z square minus 2, 2z, two whatever thing, okay? Whatever, whatever combination. Then later on, you just need to replace that x location by that combination. That is this function, okay? Remember this fact here, okay? Hopefully this is clear to you. Now, let me launch a poll. So this poll is related to a piecewise defined function and also is related to a placeholder, right? I hope you understand that. So let me give you, uh, I'll give you uh, one minute to work on this whole problem here, okay? So fx is defined in a piecewise manner. So it's x square minus one if x is less or equal to zero. It's equal x minus one if x is greater than zero. Then I ask you, what is f of a square plus one? So can you do that? So let me launch this problem here. Okay, let me, let me end here. I think I want to make a comment. So when you, I know it's a long stretch, right? So 
before you go to the class, I want you guys get ready, okay? And during the so you 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 are, you are energetic, okay? Have a good rest before that, right? And when you when you are in the class, I want you guys to stay focused, okay? And so we can follow through the lecture, and we can follow through and understand. Maybe you can even go ahead before me, okay? So that's the right away to learn, okay? And when so you think hard and uh, and uh, listen listen carefully. And uh, if you are uh, if you are posed with a question, I want you guys to try and uh, think hard and work on it. Okay, so that's uh, that way you can utilize the class time very efficiently and effectively. Okay, don't leave things. Okay, so in the class time, during the class time, and somehow you sit there and uh, and uh, like a apps app, uh, uh, apps uh, mind absent, right? And the two things that are not really focused. Then after class, somehow you oh yeah, get all these notes and the lecture and uh, try to try to catch up. That then you you are very passive, right? You, I want you to be active in learning. Okay. So when you see a question here, don't uh, don't uh, just uh, randomly pick an answer. And uh, you, I want you guys to try. Okay, and, and, uh, and do do the problem. Okay. So how about this problem here? So what's the input here? The input here is a squared plus one. I don't give you a specific number, right? So if you look at the function, the function, the function is defined in a piecewise manner. I say, oh, if the input is a uh, is non-positive, that's equal to zero. Then I use this expression. If x is positive, I use this expression. So is this guy positive or, or, or negative or zero? Then I think it's obvious to you, right? It's a squared plus one. We know square of a real number is always non-negative. A non-negative number plus one, right? Can, cannot be negative, right? So this guy should be greater or equal to one, as you can see that. So of course, this guy is what? He is positive, right? It's greater or equal to one. So then, of course, you need to choose this piece here to evaluate this function. So f is square plus one equal, use this guy. Remember, so this x is a placeholder, right? Now my x is equal what is a square plus one. So you just replace this location here, right? This placeholder by what? The a squared plus one, right? Then minus one. So the answer should be a square. Okay. Is that clear? Okay. So I think that's all I want to say about uh, um, evaluating a function. Right. Very simple. So the main thing here is placeholder. Okay. Another thing, okay, so we introduce a function. So why we want to uh, uh, introduce functions? Why we want to study functions, right? And uh, as you, from now on, this precarious class, you are going to learn all sorts of uh, mathematical functions, right? And you will learn about uh, their definitions, their properties and operations and things like that. And in calculus, you're going to learn two major operations on functions. One is called a differentiation, why is it called integration, right? So this pre-calculus class is a preparation class, right? So in terms of application, so we can use a function to describe the real world problems, okay? So, and many real world problems can be modeled as a function, as a functions, okay? And later on, you will learn that sometimes I know this is a function, but I don't know what that function is. And I know this function satisfies some kind of rules. And you want to somehow decide or determine this function. So for example, so you may curious how people do the weather prediction, right? weather forecast. So this is something related to my research. And uh, so then, so you see, I want to predict, let's say, temperature in, in Plano area, all right? So, um, so we have this very sophisticated mathematical model it tells you how the air flows, how the moisture evolves, and all these kind of things. So you can regard, for example, the temperature, right? The average temperature in Plano, you can regard this as a function of time, right? So that a function of time satisfies some very fancy equations, right? And then you can use the supercomputers to solve those equations and get the prediction using the input, using the current. Uh, uh, data, right? You use the measurements and you can predict the future temperature. But of course, you know, you cannot predict too long time, right? Too, too long in the future, okay? 
So those kind of things as, as in, you, you, you are learning in college, okay? So here I just want to give you a taste of um, mathematical modeling, okay? So you can model things as a function. So, so for example, we already learned, right? You can model, uh, you can, so geometrically, when you have a straight line, now you can, you can regard this straight line as a what? So if it's not a vertical, okay? Vertical line cannot be regarded as a function. As long as this line is not a vertical, you can think this line is a what? Is an equation, right? A linear equation. And that linear equation can be put into this slope in the separate form. So it's y equal mx plus b. m is a slope, b is the y intercept. This is the more, you can think this is the model, right? A linear function, right? Which models linear growth or linear decay. Remember the relation between the temperature in Celsius and temperature in Fahrenheit? That's a linear relation, right? And sometimes you can say, oh, my, uh, my, 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 my balance in my bank account is uh, growing linearly, right? So that means that in the first day I added $2, and the next day I have $4, and next day I have $6, you add 20 to two, right? Like that grows linearly, right? So here I have a mathematical problem here. Suppose I have a rope, right? I have a rope, and the, the length of this rope, say, is one. So I'm going to use this rope to enclose a rectangle. Suppose one side length of this rectangle is x, okay? So one side length is x, okay? So this length here is x, okay, rectangle. So now, I, so you enclose a rectangle with one side, with one side length x. So I asked you, what's the area of this rectangle? You can write down this area in terms of this x, right? Simple. So what's the area? I know how to compute the area of a rectangle. I know one side length, I need to know the other one. So, but I know, the perimeter of this uh, of this uh, rectangle is one, right? Is the, the, the whole slope, uh, whole rope. So it's one minus x minus x gives divided by two, right? One minus two x divided by two. That's this length here. Right? One minus two x divided by two. Then the product of these two guys gives you the area. Y equal x times one minus two x divided by two. See, that's a model, right? So now I can model the area of this uh, rectangle as a function of this is one side length x, where right? this rectangle is formed by this rope. Now I can ask a very interesting question here. Right? Suppose, suppose you want to, suppose this, this is the length of a fence. Okay, so now you want to use this fence to, 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 to enclose an area like that, right? So you have, you, you have this amount of fence to use, this, this, this length here, right? So I ask you, how can you choose X such that you get the largest area? Then it's a mathematical problem, right? So I have Y equal X times one minus two X over two. How to choose X? Of course, X cannot be zero, but otherwise it's zero area. X cannot be negative. You don't have a negative length. So for positive X, so how to choose this X to make this Y as big as possible? This is a very important kind of question, right? In real life, it's called an optimization problem, right? So for example, when you invest in stock market, you want to maximize your return or profit, right? So that's called an optimization problem, right? So for example, so if I want to make a can to hold a particular amount of juice, right? So how to, how to what kind of shape I should use to somehow to reduce my use of metal? So all these kind of problems are practically important, okay? So you can use mathematics to solve those problems. But of course, for the pre-calculus, I'm, I'm not going to tell you how to solve this problem, but I just tell you this is very important. Okay, I can tell you a joke. So, um, so a farmer, right? A farmer, uh, say, gives a rope to an engineer, to a physicist and to a mathematician, and ask them to use that rope to enclose a land such that the land is large, is as large as possible. So the engineer said, "Okay, I'm going to do that. I'm going to use that rope to form a square." And he claims that's the maximum area. And the physics laughed at that and say, "You should have enclosed a circle." So the circle, the area is, is, the, is the largest, okay? And what's the answer of the mathematician? So the, 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 the mathematician said, I don't need the whole rope. I just need a little piece of that. And then say, okay, so the mathematician stand here and use a rope and enclose himself and say, 
I claim everything outside of me is my, my land. <laughs> so then, of course, he gets the infinite many land, right? This one. That's just a joke, okay? I don't know if you find it interesting, uh, funny or, or at all, okay. Okay, um, so let's move on. Any uh, questions so far? No questions. So let's move to how to visualize a function, graphs of uh, functions, okay? So here we only deal with a function with a one input variable and one output variable. Of, later on, okay, you will learn functions with many inputs, for example, say the temperature in this room depends on the location and depends on time, right? So you may have a lot of deep independent variables. But here, now suppose I have a function, right? Fx only depends on x, right? So that's what we're going to learn in this whole particular. So it's a function with one variable as the input, okay? Fx. So say this function, I think we know that, right? So x is the temperature in Fahrenheit, the output is the temperature in Celsius, right? Y for f of x. So you see, Given an input, you have an output. So how many numbers you have? For this particular case, you have two numbers. Aha, in the last class, we have a tool to use, right? When you have a two numbers, you can order them, right? You get the order the pair. Then you can visualize these two numbers, this order the pair as what? As a point in the so-called Cartesian coordinate system. Remember that? This is a brilliant idea. Right, proposed by the French mathematician Descartes right, in 16th century. Okay, so in this case, we know if x is 32, y is 0 degree, 0 uh, uh, Celsius, right? If x is 212 Fahrenheit, the temperature is 100 Celsius, right? So you have two points, right? So now if I want to say, okay, so if x equals 32, y is 0, so on a Cartesian coordinate system, so we have this point for that uh, correspondence here, right? So we have this correspondence, x corresponding to zero. And then for x equal 212, I have a correspondence of 100, then I have to mark another point, right? Of course, we know this graph here, y equal fx is what? Is a line, right? So you can, for different x values here, you get different what? Different y values, and then you, have, you can draw all these uh, you can collect all these points. So the collection of all these points on this Cartesian coordinate plane is a curve. And that curve is called the graph of this function. Okay, understand that? So, definition. So, graph of a function y for f x is all the points x with the coordinates x and y. So, x takes values from the domain d. And then the corresponding y value would be just f of x, make that y from x by f, right? So, mathematically, now you say, so given an input A, use this function y for fx, right? Y for fx, I can make the output, which is called D, and D is equal f of A, right? So then you have a point here, AB, right? So that's one point on that on the curve on the graph of this function. Of course, you can do that for all the x possible x values. Then you can connect all these points. Then you see this kind of a beautiful curve here, right? So this beautiful curve here, this green curve, is called the graph of this function. So so now you see the function can be presented in two manners, right? One is algebraically as what? As an expression, say five over nine times x minus 32. That's an algebraic way to give you a function, right? Or you can present a function as a what? As a curve, right? As a curve, as a graph, okay? So you can, in, you can interpret. So we human beings are very good at uh, interpreting graphs. Then algebraic expressions, right? So if you can see the graph, you say, oh, what's going on there, right? So you can interpret that information. That's why we want to use this graph tool to understand the functions, okay? And then we know for a function, right? So when you have one input, so if I have one input here, right? If I have one input here for this x value here, right? So for this x value here, then so what's the y value? Because we know you can only have one output. <laughs> so that means if you draw a vertical line, so this is x here, okay? If you draw a vertical line through this x here, then this vertical line can only interse can intersect the, this green curve, the graph, this function only what? At most, or say at most once, right? Otherwise you get two outputs, right? 
So if you have something, if your graph looks like this, if you have something like that, then you have a vertical line. Then you see for this x value here, you can get this y value, you can get that y value, you get two points. So x, that, that, that green curve here cannot be a function, cannot be a function, right? So this is a, a very important test. When you have a graph, you can immediately see if this is a graph of function or not, because a curve in the coordinate plane is a graph of function, okay, is a graph of function. If and only if, IFF, right, IFF, if and only if what? No vertical line intersects, I forgot S, the curve more than once. I think that's quite clear to you now, right? So for example, right? Say, is this a graph, this blue curve is a graph of function? Yes, because if I draw a vertical line, only one intersection. This guy, yes, yes, right? This guy, no, right, you have two. This guy, yes, right, you draw here, yes, you draw here, yes. And, uh, but for this example here, I want to emphasize something. This function, okay, this function is, again, is a piecewise defined function, right? It takes this curve when x is less or equal to one, when x is less than one, and is uh, this curve when x is greater or equal to one. So it's a piecewise function, okay? Piecewise defined function. And so if this function, we see this function, the graph, we see the graph is what? It's broken here, right, at one. So it's called a discontinuous function, right? In beta in calculus, you learn that. But what you see here, I want to emphasize one thing here. In this case, when I have this open circle here, means what? Means this point is not a point on a curve on a graph of the function. So at x equal one, the function value is not equal to two because this point is, 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 is included, okay? Open means excluded, okay? And this guy, I use a solid, solid point here. So when it's solid, that means it's included now. This is a point on the curve, on the graph, okay? Included. So what if I ask you, what is the value of f at one? So at one, of course, you should tell me it is negative 0 0.5. Okay, not equal to. Make sense to you? So just a convention, okay? At a breaking point. Okay, I think I'm a little bit behind my schedule. Uh, that's fine. So now we can study the property of a function, right? So when I talk about a property, I think maybe it's more intuitive to look at the graph. So before I get to that point, I want to introduce some notations that probably some of you already know that, right? So we use intervals to denote a set, right? So a set can be an interval. Say, we say x is in, right? I think you saw this already, right? Is in this set. What is that set is denoted by square brackets, right? A and B, right? from A to B, comma B. What does that mean? That means x is a greater or equal to A and less or equal to B, including A and B, because I use the square brackets, okay? In other words, on a number line, so between A and B, X will take any value between A and B, including A and B. So I use a solid dot here, right? So A and B are included, right? Included. When you see this. Okay. Now, if I say X is in this interval here, this is the interval is called closed interval, okay? This is called open interval. So from A to B, that means X is uh, between A and B, but not including A and B. So X is less than B, greater than A. Okay, so if you look at the number line, so between A and B, X can be anything between A and B, but not including A and B. So A and B are excluded, right? They use the open uh, circles, right? And also I want to tell you this notation here is called, this is a line down eight, right? So it's called infinity, right? I think I told you already. So sometimes you also write down as a post infinity. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a number, as a, as a, it's, it's not a number, right? But it's, it's a, you can think it's like a number going to getting bigger and bigger, bigger and bigger, right? So it's infinitely bigger, infinitely bigger, uh, large, okay? And the next infinity, so you look at the number line here. So the infinity is somehow like it's going from the origin to the right forever, right? And the next infinity is going to the left forever, like that, okay? That's the way to understand these two notations. Okay, with that, so now we can talk about uh, one property of a function we, we, we're concerned about is called increasing and decreasing property of a function. So increasing and decreasing f, okay? So if you, if you are balancing a bank account, right? So you're, you, you would like your function 
at, at the time, right? So your balance uh, uh, in a bank account is a function of time. You would like to let a function is an increasing function, right? You don't want to be a decreasing function, right? And uh, so what do, we, what do we mean increasing function, right? So when we say, uh, this is very simple to understand, okay? So it's a, it's a self-illustrative. So F is increasing on interval from A to B, meaning what? So if you look at this graph of this function, that means the graph is what? It's rising, right? Increasing, right? As you move from left to right, right? So if we have a straight line, then we know the slope of this straight line should be what? Should be positive, right? And increasing, right? Remember that? So mathematically speaking, we say, if X2 is bigger than X1, so when you move from left to right, so X2 bigger than X1, then FX2 is that's greater than F, FX, oh, sorry. X1, right? So function that is also increased. So similarly, F is decreasing on A and B, meaning what? So you have an interval from A to B. So given any two points, right? So the function, you see, the, fun the graph of this function is what? It's decreasing, right? It's, 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 it's falling, say it's falling. So if you have, have a straight line, right? It is falling, that means the slope of now is what? It's less than zero, right? Like that. So, but never x2 greater than x1 in that interval, fx2 is less than fx1. And we say a function is a constant on that interval, that means the function does not change when, when you change your x value. So it's a horizontal line, right? Horizontal. Right, horizontal line. The slope is equal zero, right? Slope is zero. So for n x1 and x2, fx1 is same as fx2. So that's the definition of increasing, decreasing. So for example, so for example, say I have function fx equals square root of nine minus x squared, right? I have this function here. So you can write it down. So given an x as the input, what's the output? The output of y is equal to square root of nine minus x squared. So if I ask you to plot the graph of this function, so what does this graph look like? So to figure that out, so I do a little bit of algebra here, right? So y is equal to square root of nine minus x squared. And if you do the square on both sides, you get y squared equal nine minus x squared. So you move x squared to this side, you get x squared plus y squared equal three squared, right? Nine is three squared. And of course, in this case, we know this function is non-negative, right? Square root is always non-negative. So, but we know x squared plus y squared equals three squared. We know this equation defines a circle, right? From the last class we learned, right? So the circle is the origin as the center and the three as the radius. So you can draw that circle here, right? This circle here. But the function here, the graph of the function is not a whole circle. If it's a whole circle, I think that you know that does not pass the vertical line test. In this case, it's just that the upper portion of the circle because this guy should be what? Y should be greater or equal to zero. So you have only look at this upper portion of this circle. So that's the graph of this function here. That is a red curve including negative three and the positive three here, right? Including negative three. So f is zero and negative three and positive three. So that's the graph of this function here, okay? So for this function here, what's the domain now? I think you can see that the function, the domain is what? From negative three to positive three, right? It's the only value for this x values, okay? So the interval is closed from negative three to three, okay? What's the range of this function? So then you look at the here, the range is the value for all these y's, right? So you see, so the y can go from zero all the way to what? To three, right? Not a bigger than three, not a less than zero. So the range is from zero to three, right? From zero to three, right? right. That's the range. And the, the function, clearly you can see the function is what? Is in, is rising from next three, to, when you're going from left to right, right? And look at this graph here. So from left to right, you say, okay, is the rising from negative three to zero when x is from negative three to zero. But then it starts to fall in from zero to three. So now you say, okay, this function is increasing on the interval from negative three to zero and decreasing on zero to three, including negative three and zero. Okay? Make sense to you? So that's one thing we concern about a function, that property, increasing or decreasing. Another thing is about the symmetry of the function is called odd and even. This part here is very useful sometimes, okay? We say a function is even, meaning what? Meaning the graph of this function is symmetric about the y-axis, okay? Symmetric about the y-axis. What does that mean? So 
if you provide an x as the input, you get a y value here, right? But if I change this x to a negative x, I look at the opposite number, then you evaluate the function, I get the what? I get the same output. So now you see, you have a point here, you have a corresponding point at the other side, right? At the other side. And similarly, if you have a point here, then I have a corresponding point at this side here, right? So that's why the graph is symmetric about the y-axis. So mathematical speaking, you say f of negative x, so if you replace your input by negative x, then it turns out it's the same as f of x. Okay, f negative x is f of x. See that? This is the level here, okay? And that function is called a, an even function for any x in D, okay? Now, and function is called an order function, right? Order function. So for any x in the domain, f negative x is equal to negative of f x. What does that mean? So you say, okay, so then the graph of this function is symmetric about what? About the origin. So you see, when you input x, you get f x, this amount here, right? So if you get a negative x as input, then the point here would be here, right? It's negative of f x here. That is symmetric about the, about the origin here, right? About the origin. So you have a point here, x, so you say this is one, this is two. Then you have negative one and negative two here, right? So the corresponding point here. So the curve looks like that. Okay, so mathematical solution f of negative x is equal to negative of f of x for any x in the domain. So if I ask you, when I plot this graph here, I see this graph is through what? Is through the origin. But for this case, it is not, a, not a necessary through the origin here. And it turns out for the order function, it must through the origin. Do you know why? So the graph of an order function must pass through the origin. Can you figure that out? through origin. That's easy to see, right? So, so if I want to say a function is through origin, that means if f0 should be equal to 0, right? f0 equals 0. So meaning f0 equals 0, right? So you have a 0, 0 as a point on the curve. So you see, because the function is odd, right? The function is odd. So what you see here is um, if I input a negative 0 here, According to according to uh, my, my, my expression here, f negative zero should be equal what? Negative of f of zero, right? F zero. Does it make sense to you? Right. And uh, so what does that tell you? But we know negative zero is equal what? Negative zero, we know it's just zero, right? So f zero is equal to negative f zero. Does it make sense to you? Right? So f zero equal to negative f zero. A number is equal to the opposite of what this number must be zero, right? So f, so you have two f zero equal zero, right? Two f, you know, move this to this side, two f zero equal zero. That means f zero is equal to zero. See, yes. Yes, it's true letter origin, okay? Oh, let me see. I think I'm going to finish this page. I'm going to take a break, okay? So let's look at a few examples here, all right? See, fx equal x. And we know that's just a straight line. Y equal x is a straight line through the origin, right? Through the origin. So f1 is equal one. F negative one is equal negative one, right? So fx, of course, would be x. So what is the f of a negative x? F negative x, of course, remember this x is a placeholder, right? So if I want to evaluate negative x, I just replace the x by negative x. So, okay, this is useful, right? So F negative x is equal to negative x. However, F x is x. So F is negative x is equal what? Is equal negative F of x, right? Negative F x is equal to negative x. So you see F negative x is equal to negative F of x. It's a, I know it's, a, it's very confusing here. Okay, I, I, I hope you can follow. So you can check, right? So f of negative x is equal to negative of, of f of x, right? Clearly from that. So this function is what? It's odd, right? It's symmetric about the origin. Now look at this function here, right? I think we saw this guy previously. So f x is equal to x value of x. And we know it's equal to x if x is non-negative. And it's equal to negative x if x is a negative, right? Or say non-positive. 
So then we know if we want to plot a graph with functions, so okay. So this is the origin here, okay? So if the like, x is uh, smaller than zero, then I should use, the, use this next x, right? So what's the graph of the next x? We know, oh, that's a it's lines going towards the origin, right? And with the negative one as a slope. And if x is greater than zero, then it should be x. Then we should be have this graph here, right? y equal x. So together is the graph of what? y equal epsilon of x. So that's the graph. It's like, it's like a V shape, right? It's the graph of the function. Now, what's the property of this function here, right? So we say f1, of course, is equal to 1. f next 1 is also 1, right? Because f, f, f side of a next number is just the opposite of this next number, right? It's 1. So if I look at it, fx, of course, is f side of x. Now, what is f of a next x? A placeholder, right? So we plug in next x here. So it's f side of next x. But we know f side of next x is the same as f side of x. Right? It's all non-negative. So you see, these two guys are what? Are the same now. So which means f of negative x is f of x. By definition, this function is what? It's even, right? So clearly it's even, right? It's matched about the y-axis. Okay. Now look at this example here, f x equal x squared plus two. Now, if I look at the f next to x, so replace the holder, right? So you replace x by next to x, replace x by next to x. What I get here is a x squared minus x. Change the hand, right? So next to x squared is x squared. Next to x is minus x. However, next to f x is equal what? Is equal next to x squared minus x. Now you compare. So you see, I use green pen here. So f of next to x is the same as f x. So here is x squared plus x, here is x squared minus x. Not the same, right? So f next to x is not equal to fx. The function is not a what? Not even, right? Not even. For even, you know, when you change the sign, you get the same function value. Similarly, when you look at the f for next to x, which is x squared minus x, but next to fx is equal to what? Next to x squared minus x. So here is the next to x, next to x, but here is the x squared, is next to x squared is different, right? So again, f of next to x is not a negative of fx. So this means the function is not odd either. So in this case, this function is neither even nor odd. Make sense to you? So before I take a break, uh, let me launch this code here. Wait, so what does it look like? If it's neither, graph? Uh, what does the graph look like if it's neither even nor odd? So um, later on, we'll learn how to plot this kind of a function here, okay? So for example, I can draw just give an example here, not a, not a graph of this function. So, so probably I can try. That's the, so maybe it looks like this, x plus x so is x plus half, x plus half square minus one fourth. So the graph looks like this. So the half one fourth here. Like this. So the para later on we'll learn about this function called a quadratic function. So the graph looks like this. Clearly, it's not a symmetric. This y is here. That is not a symmetric. You can, if you flip the, this graph to, uh, around the y, you don't get the same thing, right? So it's not a symmetric about the y. It's not a symmetric about the origin. Origin is here either, right? The graph looks like that. You can have you can have a lot of functions. For example, if you draw a function like this, that's not a, uh, even, not an odd either, right? Odd and even functions are kind of special functions, okay? With special properties. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. So let me launch this poll, then we can take a break and we can move on to the next portion. Yeah. So um, I know many of you are familiar with this material, but uh, this is just a pick up these things, right? So we can we are ready for 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 later lectures. Okay. I think this poll probably. Yeah. Okay. Here. So if f x is an order function, and I know this point is a point on the graph. Then which point is also on its graph? Fifteen more seconds. Should be easy to figure that out, right? You're kind of showing the answers. Ah, I show you answer. You're showing the results, and everyone's it says one hundred percent on one of the answer choices so everyone knows which one it is. Oh, okay. Okay, 
Okay, I think I, uh, let me end here. Let me close the polling here. So it's obvious, right? Because so we know five negative three is a point somewhere here, right? Five, five negative three. And we know the graph is what? Is symmetric about the origin, right? So, so if I change five to negative five, right? So this is positive five, this is negative three. Then the function value will also flip, right? So if it's negative five, then it should be flip of this, should be positive three here. So it's at this point, right? At this point. Yeah, symmetric about this origin here. So the answer should be negative five positive three, right? We are sure about that. Okay. Okay, so let uh, me let us take a three minute break. So, so we re re resume at four eighteen. Okay, so leave your screen and stretch and rest your eyes. Okay, drink some water. Right, get uh, some rest. Okay, so you. Yeah. Yes, remind me already by the first report. Okay. So let me end the polling. So what's the answer? Now you see, so this curve, this curve, this red curve is obtained by shift by shifting the green curve both vertically and horizontally suppose i do um they do the uh, horizontal shifting first right so you see zero x equals zero is shift to x equal what negative three right to x equal negative three is shifting to what to the left if the shift to the left, of course, if you do, I can do one more graph. So I shift, shift here. Get this curve here, like that, right? But that black curve is what? Is f of shift to the left by three units. So it should be f x what? Plus three. Remember that? Plus a positive number is shifting to left. So that's the black curve, right? Then to get another red curve, now, this the, the, the y coordinates here is one, then that, this y coordinate here is two. So here is one, this is two. So you, shift, you need to shift upward by what? By one, right? So then you just add this by what? By one. So gx is equal what? gx is equal f of x plus three and plus one. Okay? Next, reflecting. This is very easy to understand, reflecting the graph of f. The first part is easy, but the second part maybe is a little bit confusing. So suppose I have a graph y equal fx, which is this green curve here. Now, what, what's the graph of y equal negative fx? Okay, so again, so take a one arbitrary point on this green curve, say x not fx not. Then the corresponding point on the y equal negative fx would be x not equal fx not, then it's negative of fx not. So these two points, right, at the same x not location, y is above, y is below, and the same distance from the x-axis, which means these two points are what? Are symmetric about the x-axis, right? Or symmetric in the x-axis. So this x-axis looks like a mirror. So this is like the image of this green curve. 
Okay, of this, uh, this point here is like an image platform. So this is called a uh, mirror symmetry, okay? So it's called a reflection. So similarly for all the points, right? So for this point here, above, then below, like this, right? So, so the graph of y equal negative of x is a reflection of the graph of y equal fx in, or say, about the like x axis. Okay, that's easy to understand. Now, how about this case? This one is a little bit harder, okay, to comprehend. So now suppose I have a graph of y equal fx, this green curve here, right? And this is the after point, so x naught, fx naught, this point here is the after point here, okay? So what happens to this point if I change my function to y equal of f negative x? So I replace x by negative x. So then what you see here is, so you see here is, okay, so look at this f, sorry. Look at this function here, this vector function, y equal f of negative x. If I evaluate this function at negative x naught, at this value here, what do I get? So you see, okay, so x is a placeholder, right? So this x is replaced by this negative x here, right? So it's minor negative x naught, which is a minor minor positive, so it's fx naught. So what you realize is f for this red function at negative x naught, you get the same y value. So meaning this point here somehow corresponding to this left point here, which is symmetric about the y axis. Similarly for all other points, because this is just an after point. So what you see here is this red curve, the graph of a function y equal f of negative x, okay, is what? Is a reflection of the graph of y equal fx, this green curve, about what? About the y axis. Make sense to you? So graph of y equal f of negative x is the reflection of the graph of y equal fx in or say about the y axis. Okay? So that's another transformation, reflection. So basically just take this green curve and flip around the y. Here, take a green curve, for the first case, take a green curve, flip around the x, right? That's called a reflection. So next, <coughs> stretching and compressing, okay? Stretching and compressing. So previous operations, you see the shapes are not changed. It's a reflection or shifting, right? So it's the same shape. But now on, actually, you are going to change the shape. So it's not a rigid transformation. It's called a non-rigid transformation, okay? So you, the graph will be distorted, okay? Distorted. Just like a, if you have a flat mirror, you look at yourself in your flat mirror, you, you, you your image is exactly the same as you, right? So no distortion. But if you have a, a curved surface, like a curved mirror, I think you, in some um, amusement park, you do people see that kind of a, a funny mirror, right? If you stand there, you see your, your image is very funny because you get a distortion, right? You may have a bigger head and small legs, things like that, right? So now we're talking about that kind of a transformation, okay, with distortion. So. So first, let's look at a vertical stretching and a compressing, or compressing, okay? So now, suppose I have a graph for fun function y equal fx here, like a green curve here, right? Now, what's the graph of y equal c times fx? So again, analyze the behavior or the effect by multiplying c, right, to one after the point. So I have an after the point, x not fx not on the green curve, this point here, okay? So now if you look at this red function, what's the value of this red function at uh, x naught, c f x naught, so, uh, c f x, so it's x naught, so c times f x naught. So you see, so this point here now is a move to, uh, is, a, is a what, is a distorted to this point here, right? So c times f x naught, okay? So it's amplified, right? The y value is amplified by c, okay? So that's called a stretch, right? So similarly for this guy, Stretch to this point. So the, the ratio, now it's not a distance, now it's the ratio of the y value is always the C, right? So the ratio is the same. So for example, if I look at the zero point here, zero multiplied by C is zero. So this point is not get a distorted, it's not a, it's not a moving, right? So that's why you see this kind of behavior, okay? The ratio is the same. It's not a distance, the same. So of course, if C is a positive, is greater than one, then your 
you, you multiply this y value by, 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 by factor, which is bigger than one. So it's called stretching, right? It's stretched, right? So this, this radical will be above this guy because it's bigger, okay? And for this case, if C is less than one, then the radical becomes below, right? Because you multiply two by half, for example, you get a one, right? So it's somehow it's compressing, right? It's, 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 it's called a compressing effect. So in this case, if I summarize, so graph of C times Fx, so if C is greater than one, then the graph of C Fx is the graph of F stretched vertically, right, by factor C. And if C is less than one, and, and then suppose it's a positive, okay? And then graph of F is a compressed vertically by factor C. I think this is easy to understand, okay? The next is a little bit confusing. Hopefully you can follow well. Any question about this part here? Okay. So now, what happens if I replace this argument, this input x by c times x? This c is not multiplied to as f, it's multiplied to this x here, okay? Now, what you see here is, so suppose this green curve is the graph of y equal fx. Okay, and I have up to the point x not f x not, which is this point here, right? This point here. Now what happens? So look at the y equal f of c x. <clears throat> it turns out if I re if I evaluate this red function y f c x at x not over c, okay. So place holder, right? I replace this x by x not over c. So it's f over c times x not over c. Then becomes what c c cancelled. So it's f x not. So in another word, for this red function, y f, y f of c x, it gets the same f x naught at a, a different x value, which is x naught over c, right? So in other words, so this point, x naught f x naught somehow becomes this point, which is at x naught over c, right? Then you, 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 you compress this point toward the y axis, right? So it's called a horizontal, horizontal compressing, right? So when C is greater than one, you, 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 have, you, you can use a smaller X value to get the same Y value, right? So for example, if this is two, C is equal to two. So this is two, then this should be one. See, you use one, you can get the same value as a, at a two for this green function. So that's called a compressing, right? So you compress this green curve toward the Y axis, right? You get this red curve. And similarly, if C is less than one, then of course is what? Is a, Stretching, right? So you use you need to use a bigger x. It was x not over a small c. You need to use a bigger x value to get the same f x value here, right? For example, like this. So this point here now is what is a stretch to to this point here, right? So stretching effect. So to summarize, so the graph of y equal f of c x. So if C is greater than one, then the graph of F compressed horizontally by factor C. If C is less than one greater than zero, then the graph of F stretched horizontally by factor C. Make sense to you? Any questions about this part here? Okay, so let's look at one example here. Now you can see you can you can plot the graph of a complicated function, use a very simple function, okay? So here is an example here, okay? I want to show you. Um, let me use my hand, okay? So y equal x square, right? I use this as an example a lot, of, a lot of times, right? So this is a, a, a quadratic function, right? It's generic quadratic function, y equal x square, para, para, the, a curve is called a parabola, right? It's a parabola. So if I change x, so that's step one, let me, this is which color? Let me use my uh, orange color is not used yet. Okay. So from here to here, so that's my step one, okay? So I'm going to change fx to f of half of x, right? So you replace x by half of x, right? So this is a fx. So this is a f of half of x. Remember that? So when you ch change x to cx, if c is less than y, it's called what? It's called stretching you know, horizontally, right? So then the curve, see, this point here, for example, is stretched to this point here, right? By a factor of what? By a factor of two, right? By a factor of 
by a factor of um, by a factor of, 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 of a half, right? Okay, so you get this a uh, uh, dash the black curve here, black, dash the black curve. Okay, coming from y by x scale, stretching, right? Stretching. Now. Okay, now so so from this step to this step here, it's that second step. So I'm going to multiply the f of half of x by another half. Okay, so a, a half of half of x. Now we know if you multiply this function by half, you you are doing what? You are doing the because this c now is less than one, right? You are doing the compression in the vertical direction, right? So there's a black curve here. Right? Let me just change it here. The black curve now is compressed to this. Uh, uh, this is called pink. Right? This is a pink curve here. This is a half of a half of x here. This, does it make sense to you? So it's a compressing from here. This point is compressed to this point here. Right? The ratio is the same, right? The ratio is always a half. And finally, I'm going to uh, from let me see. Now I do it from this step here, from this guy to this guy here. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to multiply by next one. Right? So it's negative over half over f over half x. So when you multiply this function here, this whatever this function is, right, by next one, so it's called a reflection about what? Reflection about the x axis. See, so this pink curve now is reflected to this, uh, uh, this light blue curve here, right? I don't know what's the name for this color here, whatever. This this curve here. Cyan. Okay, cyan color. Okay. Okay, so then of course this is a graph of a negative of this thing here, right? Next thing. And finally, I can shift this curve to the shift this curve down by by uh, by negative half. Right? Then shift to the right by by one. So what are you going to do? So I do the two shifts together. Okay, so that's the last step here. This is the third step. The last step is going from here to here, right? Fourth step. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to see, subtract the x by next one. You shift this guy to the what? To the, let me maybe I can draw a picture here, okay? To the left, right? Uh, to the right, right? To the right. Then you minus half, then you shift down. You finally get this red curve here, which is a, Graph of this function. Does that make sense to you now? So you can do this kind of analysis. I have a homework problem. You can you can practice this, okay? So you get a, get a good at that, okay? And later on, when we talk about a trigonometrical function, we use this, okay? We do this shifting, okay? So to test, so let me launch another poll, okay? To explain a little bit. So this green curve. Right, like a V shape is the graph of y over fx. Then I have this is a, like an inverted v, but it's a kind of smaller, right? Something like that, right? It's called a y, the graph of y over gx. So I tell you, graph of gx is obtained from the graph of y over fx by reflection, right? Clearly, you see have reflection because it's, a, it's a reflective, right? And also compression because you see the mechanism is different, right? In the x direction, in the x direction, the range is different. In the y direction, the range is also different. So I tell you which one can be GX, okay? Of course, some of them can, cannot be true, but one of them maybe is the correct answer. So you, I want you to pick, pick that form, form for GX. This is a little bit harder problem, okay? So think, I'll give you one minute to work on that, okay? And see if you can get that. You need to, you need to uh, look at these three answers and try to, try to eliminate them, okay? So the first answer is 1.5 times fx, the second one next three times that, then 1.5 times that, okay? So you think you can refer your, your, your notes, uh, if you forget about us, Compressed for stress, see, great, and see, that's what you can, you can be first.
the optimum homework problem in some okay, practice. I hope you can memorize that. I have 20 responses so far. Let me give you 10 more seconds, okay? Get engaged or get involved, okay? Yeah, that's very important. Okay, I think I should stop, okay. I think most of you got it right, okay? My majority got it right. So clearly, I forget the, the choice. What's the choice? Um, so clearly, you see, I think the choice is, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, it should be negative 1.5 uh, GF of 3x. Is that right? OK. So why is this? So first, you know, you should be it's reflection, right? So you, should, you have a negative sign in front of this, right? So it's negative. So if you do the negative, then you reflect this whole thing to, to something like this. Like that, right? Like that. Then you see, okay, this one actually is, uh, you know, what direction actually is, is what? It's a, uh, I think it's not 1.5, it's half. It's not half of 1.5, I forget it. It is 1.5. Oh, then it's not the right answer. Yeah. You should have a compression in a vertical direction. Yeah. yeah, that's why I was asking if you were supposed to also add by reflection, compression, and stretching. Yeah, okay. Maybe it's a, a negative half. I probably made a mistake. Okay, sorry for that. So then, now you can do what? Do the compression, right? So you need to multiply this function by a value, which is what? Which is smaller than one, right? So you so make this like like this, like this, something like that, right? Compressing, right? Compressing like that. And finally, you want to compress in the what? In the horizontal direction. So of course, you need to multiply this x by a number bigger than three, right? Because when this is bigger, then it's a compression. If it's smaller than one, then it's a stretching. So then you use three here. Okay. So that's the way to do this problem. Okay. And sorry, I think when I Made the poll probably I didn't pay attention. Okay, uh, I still have a few pages I want to finish, otherwise you cannot do this homework problem. But this part here should be light, should be easy, okay? So this graphing transformation stuff, I hope after this lecture you will be super clear about that, okay? Do some practice and you know how to do this. This is very useful. And in calculus, we are going to learn how to plot a we don't use we don't use we don't use a plotting graph uh, devices like a calculator or computer, and give a function I can use a, a calculus and also also use this transformation. We can we can do things. We can try to sketch the graph of the functions how it, how it behaves. Okay. So last topic here. So probably I need uh, fifteen more minutes to get this done. Combination of functions. This is easy, right? So. Function equal functions. So functions f and g are equal if they have the same domain, which means they take same numbers, right, and uh, produce the same outputs, right. So, and f x equal g x for each x in the domain. Okay. So for example, so I have f x equal half times two x square minus. Let me change my hand. Half times two x square minus six plus three. That's f x. I have g x is equal x square, right. So clearly, the domain of both f and g would be what? Would be all the real numbers, right? No restrictions here, right? You can square any number. So it's a, a set of real numbers. Or sometimes we say the uh, interval from negative infinity to positive infinity, the whole what? Whole number line, right? Whole number line, okay? Um, now, for nx in the domain, then what is fx? fx is a half of 2x square minus 6 plus 3, and you can do algebra, simplify, right? So it's a division. So it's a, x squared minus three plus three is x squared, which is the same as gx. So these two functions are what? Are equal. Same domain, same output, right, for any x. Now this question here is interesting. My fx is equal x. My gx is equal x squared divided by x. 
Are these two functions equal functions, the same functions? So you may say, oh, they are same because x divided by x is equal to x. The answer is wrong. Why? So for fx, the domain can be any real number, right? It's just x. However, for gx, the gx is a, a ratio, is a fraction, right? So x by over x. So that x is on the denominator here, okay? So we know it cannot divide by zero, so x cannot be zero. So the domain is not an order value of x uh, over the real number. It's a, from negative infinity to zero, zero not included. Then from zero to cos infinity, in another word, look at the number line here, you have all the numbers except what? This guy is excluded here, zero is excluded. So that's the way to write down the domain. This notation here, I want to tell you later on, you see something like that, you know what it means. It means union. Okay, it's a set, union of two sets. Okay, so it means it's either in that or in that, right? It's like all relation. Okay, and later on, you will see another thing called end. So that's called an intersection. So in this case, f is different from g. f is not equal to g, even though when x is non zero, then we say, okay, gx can be simplified as x, which is equal to fx. Okay, so if you look at the graph of these two functions, see the graph of f, we know is y equal x is a little straight line, right, including all the points. But for the gx, you know that line is not defined at x equals zero here, right? So it's the line, but with a hole. So the graph is different, okay? Difference, a difference by a point. And similarly, you can do some difference, product, a quotient for all x in the, in the section of the domains of the two functions. Okay, suppose d1 is the domain for f, d2 is the domain for g, then if x is in the common region of these two domains, so that's a way to say that, okay? So x belongs to d1 in the sector d2. So this is called intersection, this notation I just mentioned here, right? So, that's, so if for x in this common, uh, region, then you can do what? You can combine these two functions. You can add, so, so this is the notation here, f add gx is fx plus gx for x input. So f minus gx is fx minus gx. f gx is fx times gx. f over gx is fx over gx. Of course, we require gx non zero, okay? That's very obvious, very simple. For example, say fx equals square root x plus one, gx equals square root four minus x squared. So if I ask you, what is f over g zero? So this is a combination of f of two functions, right? So then you say, okay, so fx is the square root of x plus one, gx is equal to this guy, so f over g, is, that's the expression here, right? So then you evaluate, so zero, of course, is in the domain of fx and also is in the domain of g, right? No problem, when you put zero here, put zero there, right? So that's the case, right? So in this case, you could put zero, right? So zero for f, and zero for g, evaluate, and then divide, you get a half, okay, simple. So this part here is very obvious, okay, now, this combination is interesting, okay, it's called a composition of functions, okay? So just like that uh, previous analogy, right, you have this juice machine, right? So maybe you can put a, a, a fruit in the juice machine, right, you get a juice, which is the cold juice, you get a juice, right? Then you put another machine, maybe the heating machine, then you can get a what? Maybe, maybe it's not a heating machine, maybe it's a, 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 a cooling machine, then you get like a popsicle, right? <laughs> so you can pass a fruit to the juice machine, you get a juice, okay? Then you put the juice to another machine, then you get a popsicle, right? That's called a comp composition. So similarly, you can do this for functions, right? So, so suppose I have a function G, so you take the x number as input, you produce a number, it's called gx, <coughs> this number is called gx. Then you use this gx, this number here at the input for this x, right? So fruit, juice, this gx is my juice. And put juice into the, this cooling machine, this f here, right? So gx, this number at the input to f, then get an f works on this g, right? f, take this gx as the input, and work on, on that gx and get a number. This is called f of g of x, right? So this is called a composition, okay? I will introduce the notation soon. So for example, suppose gx is for x squared, fx equals square root of x plus 21. So if I ask you, what is the f of g2? So it's simple. So you first you compute g2 first, right? So g2 is equal, say, 2 squared, 4. 
Then F. What happened? I somehow made a mistake. Okay. See the link should be two. So then I can do what? G two F as a G two as an input to F, right? So it's F of two, right? Uh, F of four. The G two is equal four. So then is a square root of four plus twenty one, which is equal five, right? It fix your notes, right? I think I have, I have some typos, okay? So that's the way to get an F of G two. Very simple to understand, right? Now if I reverse it also, in this case you see. 2 is the input to G, I get a 4. G2 is 4. And 4 as the input to F, you get a 5, right? So if I ask you, what is the F of GX? So FX is equal to square root of X plus 21. Remember that this X is a placeholder. So F of whatever thing here, you just put that at the thing at the location for X, right? That's a placeholder. So now I have f of gx, just gx is just a number written in this funny way, right? So gx, uh, no, at the end of the day, is just a number. So this number here, you should put it into that placeholder. So it's a gx here, right? The square root of gx plus 21. Now we know what is gx really? gx is x squared. So this is f of gx is f of x squared. So then it's square root of x squared plus 21. So you get f of gx, which is equal to square root of x squared plus 21. And similarly, if I want to compute g of fx, right? So gx is equal to x squared, then we know this x is a placeholder, right? So if you put f as an input for g, so what do you get? So is f of x squared, right? This x is fx squared. Then fx is equal to square root of x plus one. You put a square root of x plus one, then you do the square, you get x plus 21. So g of fx is x plus 21. So what do you see here in this example here is f of g, is uh, this guy, this my hand here, right? This is square root of x plus one. But g of f is x plus one. Different, right? So normally f on g of x is different from g of f of x because of the order change. You you pass through different machines, right? For example, look at that analogy. So if you put the fruit, you put the fruit in the cooling machine first, you get a frozen fruit. Now you put a frozen fruit in the juice machine, you get a what? You get a very cold juice. That's it. It's not a popsicle. Okay, so that's the difference, okay? So now you can understand this definition very well, right? So the composition of the function f with the function g is like a f, this is like a circle, open circle, it means composition, okay? f composite of g of x. So it's a new function, right? A new function, which is f of gx, okay? So the domain, so this part here, I want you to, to pay attention here. So the domain of this composite function of this f composite of g is what? So, so look at this picture here, okay? This picture. So you take x from the domain of g, right? Then you compute, you get gx. Then this gx in order to, this gx is the input to f. So you need to make sure this gx is also in the what? In the domain of f. So what, so you cannot choose all the x value because maybe you have some x as the input here. Then this input gives you outputs. This output is not in the domain, right? So you need to choose a particular x value from the domain of g. So this is the statement here. The domain of f composite of g is all, composition of g is all the x in the domain of g such that what g x is in the domain of f. So you need to guarantee that too, okay? So you cannot choose all the x for in the domain of g. Maybe just a part of them such that gx makes sense for this f here. Does it make sense to you? So, so give an example here. How many material here? I think we're almost done here, okay? Um, example here. So for example, so fx equal x squared minus 16. gx equal square root of x. I want you to find the f composite of g, so the composition of f with g and its domain, okay? So f composite g, x is equal f of gx, right? So what is gx? gx is equal square root of x. So, you, so f is, is equal x squared minus 16. So you replace this x by gx here, right? Placeholder, right? So it's gx squared minus 16. But then you substitute gx square root of x here. So it's square root of x squared minus 16 equal x minus 16. So that's the composite of these two functions. So what's the domain? So you say, ah, oh, x minus 16. You can take any value of x, right? Domain.
and any x value, all the real numbers, x minus 16, right? You can take x and x value to put here, right? The answer is wrong. Why? <laughs> domain, not domain. Oh, sorry. <laughs> domain, yeah. It's not, not this guy, okay? So why? So look at these three functions here. F and the G and the composite of MG. So Fx is x squared minus 16. So what's the domain of Fx? We know x can be anything, right? So, so, so the domain of Fx is what? Is, is anything. Is from negative infinity to positive infinity. But what is the domain of G? X cannot be negative, right? So domain of G is from zero to infinity, including zero. Right? So for this domain of G, now for get any input of G, then what's the output? So the output here is what? Is zero to infinity, because when you do the square of any number, non-negative, you get also non-negative numbers, right? So the range of G is zero to infinity. And then you see, okay, so given X input from G, right? Given X, which is from the domain of G, then, I know the output is in this range from zero to infinity. It was square root of x, right? Let me write down here. Okay. X is a positive. So then we know, okay, for f, this f has no restriction. So, okay, your g give me, so your, so your g provides me this gx, which is a positive number. That's okay for you because this zero to infinity is inside the domain of f, right? So this is no problem for f. So, so the domain of f comes to g. So it's any x value which make g happy, right? So as long as g can receive, take that x is fine. So the domain of f of g is what? Zero to infinity, not all the real numbers. Okay, it's the domain of, of g itself in this case, okay? So not the infinity to, to, to negative infinity. So it's by looking at this f, x minus 16, okay? And similarly, if I want to look at the G composite of G composition of F, right, and its domain, then okay, G X square root of X, F X, X square root of 16. So G of F X, so it's the square root of F X with the square root of X minus 16. Okay, what's the domain of this function now? So domain of F is what? Negative infinity to positive infinity, right? So the F is the first layer, right? So you go to the F, then you go to the G, right? You go to the G, so G of F, right? G of F, G of F, okay? So you may say, oh, is the domain of this function is a negative infinity to positive infinity? No, you can not because f, you see the domain of g is from zero to infinity. So only, to, you, so, need to, so need to find x in this, in this uh, domain of f such that what? Such that this f x, the output of f should be in the domain of g, right? The output of, let me repeat, the output of f, which is f x, should be in the domain of G, right? Look at this picture here, right? Look at this picture. Should be in the domain of G. So what's the domain of G? Gx is the square root of x, right? So we may, we, if, which means fx, x square minus 16 should be greater or equal to zero. That gives you x greater or equal to 16 or x greater or equal to four or x less or equal to four. So that's the domain, okay, for, for the function. And this domain is a, is inside the domain of f, right? f can take anything. So the domain of g comes of f is a greater or equal to four or less or equal to negative four, which can be written in this manner, right? In this manner, okay? Four to positive infinity or negative infinity to negative four and a union of that, union of that. That's the domain. Okay, so finally, so if I have this function here, y equal two x plus five power eight, can you write down this function as a composition of two functions? There are many, many ways to, to do that, okay? I think the obvious way to do that is you realize this is a something power eight. So it's a something power eight. So you immediately say you can introduce a function fx is x power eight. Then this x is a placeholder here, right? So what do you need to substitute here? Should be substitute two x plus five. You can introduce gx as two x plus five. So then you regard, this function here as f of gx, right? So it's a 2x plus 5 power 8, okay? So it's, this function can be regarded as here, f composite of g in this manner. You can do other ways, okay? 
So let me ask, uh, let me launch a poll question here. I think I will stop, okay, here. Uh, this is the last question, okay? So fx is equal to x squared minus 16. gx is equal to square root of x. What is f composite of g at uh, 16? I'll give you one minute to work on this problem here. So this is the last poll. Let's call it a composite fun, okay? <laughs> Hopefully you have fun. Wait, there's no correct answer. Really? No, there's no correct answer. Um, yeah, it should be zero. Okay, that yeah, is the end of the poll. Yeah, because f composite of g is x minus 16. It's not an f zero g, it's f composite of g. Evaluate at a 16. Yeah. yeah. Zero. Uh, let me try. Okay. Okay, Isn't the answer stop. zero? So what is the what's the meaning of f comes to g? So is we know is f right? Take a g as the input, right? And this that's f comes to g. Make sense to you? So when you want to compute this guy, that means is f of g at a sixteen, right? Makes sense if you so the, the point here is this your g is in the first machine, right? You put a 16 over there, then get output, then the output is separated to f here, right? Then get the output, and I ask you what is this guy here, right? So what is the g16? G16 <coughs> is equal g is square root of x, so it's square root of 16, right? Which is equal 4. So then this guy would be equal what? F4. Oh, you're right, it should be zero. <laughs> My bad, I didn't see this is square here, yes. Very good. So then is a four square minus 16, then should be equal zero. So the answer should be zero. Great. See, you can catch my mistakes, okay? Uh, if you don't have any questions, then we can end here. And if you do have a few questions to clarify this lecture, and you can stay and ask me, okay? Otherwise, you can leave. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.